This is a production of the Chemical Education Material Study. The number and variety of living systems is remarkable. More than a billion species currently exist. We now know that a principal factor in this large number is the billions of ways that four rather simple chemicals can vary their sequence in forming DNA genes. We are also discovering that many illnesses can be identified at the molecular level. This provides information for the design and synthesis of molecules which can be used to treat the disease. If we examine living cells under the microscope like these plant cells or these bacteria or this animal tissue, we can see the movement, growth, and cell reproduction, which are the result of successions of chemical reactions. In attempting to control these reactions, physicians have used various substances, some from nature and some synthesized in the laboratory. Many of the compounds found to be useful were discovered by trial and error. One such compound was sulfanilamide. Let's demonstrate the effect of sulfanilamide on bacterial growth. A nutrient medium in a petri dish is used to sustain growth of bacterial organisms. These bacteria, harmful to humans, are carefully transferred from a stock preparation. They are gathered in a wire loop and streaked onto the nutrient medium in both compartments of this dish. A small piece of sterilized filter paper is wet with a sulfanilamide solution and placed on the bacteria in one compartment of the petri dish. The dish is placed in an incubator for 24 hours. During that period, seen here in time-lapse photography, the bacteria multiply and become visible as large colonies everywhere except in the area around the paper disc. The clear zone shows that bacterial growth has been stopped. This inhibition is due to the sulfanilamide from the disc. How does sulfanilamide stop the growth of these harmful bacteria? First, let's examine the function of one of the key molecules that exists in the bacterial cells. It is called para-aminobenzoic acid. Using a geometric symbol retaining the general contours of the molecule, we'll follow its action within the cell. In the cell with the acid is an essential bacterial enzyme. In order for the enzyme to perform its active role, it must first combine with the para-aminobenzoic acid only then can the enzyme catalyze the further reactions necessary to cell life. When we examine the structure of the acid molecule and compare it to a molecule of the drug sulfanilamide, we find that they are much alike. This large portion of each is identical. The electron charge distribution in each molecule is also similar and their general configurations are the same. Using geometrical representations again, let's include sulfanilamide in the bacterial cell along with the normally present acid molecule. The sulfanilamide too can react with the enzyme. 
but the sulfanilamide not only fails to activate the enzyme as a catalyst, it also prevents the acid from doing so. Thus, metabolism stops and the bacterial cell dies. The effect of sulfanilamide on cell growth was found by trial and error. But the discovery that sulfanilamide is structurally similar to an essential molecule accounted for the action of the drug. This principle of structural similarity helps us to predict which drugs might be effective against specific diseases. Consider, for example, the use of drugs in the treatment of cancer. By means of tissue culture technique, human cells are kept alive for microscopic observation. Here are normal human skin cells under the microscope. In time-lapse photography, cellular activity appears accelerated. We know of very few differences between the chemistry of normal cells and these cancer cells. One remarkable difference, however, is that the cancer cells grow faster. And another difference is that during the faster growth, the cancer cells use abnormally large amounts of a substance known as uracil. Can a structural modification of the uracil molecule be used to disrupt the fast growth of the cancer tissue? Let's follow some of the steps a biochemist takes in answering such a question. He is familiar with the visible parts of a single cell, like this one undergoing division. We see a set of dark ribbons in the middle of the cell. These dark objects are chromosomes, and they are intimately connected with the process of cell growth. The biochemist has learned to collect chromosomal material from cells and has found that it is composed of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. Because DNA is a large, complex molecule, it is helpful to break it into its component parts and identify them. These component parts can be separated from each other by the technique of paper chromatography. After treatment with an acid, a small drop of the chromosomal material is placed on this large piece of filter paper. The paper is rolled into a convenient shape for the next procedure. We have selected a solution in which the chromosomal material is readily soluble. This is placed in the bottom of a glass cylinder. The solvent is drawn up the filter paper by capillary action. After 12 hours, the solvent front has risen this far. The filter paper is removed and allowed to dry. It is then rolled in the opposite direction and put back in a different solvent. This will ensure a further and better separation of the molecular components. These components are not visible under ordinary light, but if we place an ultraviolet light under the dried paper, we can see that the solvent has distributed the components of the chromosomal material. This distribution has occurred because the solvent front competes with adhesion to the paper for the chromosomal materials, so the components move according to their molecular size and solubility. Thus, different compounds derived from the chromosomes are separated. We'll cut out one of these marked areas and dissolve the material from the paper with another solvent. Now we can analyze the dissolved material with an infrared spectrometer. A characteristic spectrum is produced by each component separated in the chromatography procedure. 
The absorption spectrum produced by one of these extracts is compared with the known absorption spectrum of the chemical thymine. Apparently, chromosomes contain thymine. Similar analysis of the other components shows that each has its own characteristic spectrum. Identification shows that besides thymine, chromosomes contain adenine, guanine, and cytosine. How do our uracil molecules, which are present in such large amounts in cancer cells, relate to the constituents we have extracted from the chromosomes? We know that these constituents, along with other building blocks, are necessary to make DNA molecules, which in turn have a part in forming the chromosomes. Biochemists have shown that uracil is the substance from which thymine is formed. Without uracil, thymine will not form, preventing the synthesis of DNA, which in turn prevents the formation of the chromosome. When we examine the molecular structures of uracil and thymine, we find that there is but one position in which these structures differ. To convert uracil into thymine, a hydrogen atom here must be replaced by a methyl group such as this. Let's symbolize uracil with its hydrogen atom like this to follow its action within a cell. First, a chemical group called a sugar phosphate residue becomes attached to the uracil molecule. The modified uracil compound then forms a complex with an enzyme. Somehow the enzyme converts the hydrogen into a methyl group to form the thymine compound. This molecule is then freed for eventual synthesis into the DNA chain. How can we disrupt this mechanism and stop cell growth? Clearly, one point of attack is the original uracil molecule. This molecule can be altered in many ways. One of the most promising has been to replace this hydrogen with a fluorine to give 5-fluorouracil. 5-fluorouracil has a number of advantages. First, the hydrogen and fluorine are almost the same size, so that both molecules should fit into the enzyme. Second, the chemistry of a carbon-fluorine bond differs from that of a carbon-hydrogen bond, so that the enzyme might find it difficult to replace the fluorine with a methyl group. And finally, the changed polarity may allow the fluorine compound to adhere more firmly to the enzyme than would a uracil compound. Thus, we predict that the 5-fluorouracil, just like the uracil, will attach itself to a sugar phosphate residue and then fit into the same place on the enzyme the uracil would have used. But once in place, the strong bond to fluorine will prevent the enzyme from replacing the fluorine with a methyl group. And finally, we predict that the strong polarity of the 5-fluorouracil will cause such strong adherence to the enzyme that the normal uracil compound will be prevented from reacting and that, with the enzyme blocked, the essential chromosomal material cannot be made and the cell will die. Let's test this prediction in the laboratory. Here are two cultures of cancer cells. Those on the left have been treated with 5-fluorouracil. Compare the action of these cells to that of the untreated cells on the right. The untreated cells continue to show rapid growth. The 5-fluorouracil treatment is seen to stop cell division, produce cellular enlargement, and eventually contraction and death. But are we sure that the cancer growth is stopped in the manner we predicted? Instead of the 5-fluorouracil blocking the enzyme, as we have suggested, and using this means to kill the cell, is it possible that the 5-fluorouracil is incorporated into the DNA, inhibiting its function? 
To determine where the 5-fluorouracil is acting, in the enzyme or the DNA, let's conduct an experiment on some human cancer cells grown in the laboratory. A sterile pipette is used to transfer the cells into a large flask which contains a nutrient medium. This permits continued growth so that we will have enough cells for our experiment. The cells are kept in suspension by a magnetic stirrer and incubated for several days. Here is specially prepared 5-fluorouracil containing radioactive carbon-14. By tagging the 5-fluorouracil with these radioactive atoms, we can determine where the 5-fluorouracil goes in a human cell. We will add a small amount of the radioactive 5-fluorouracil to the living culture. In about half an hour, these radioactive molecules will be incorporated into the cancer cells. The cancer cell suspension is poured into large cups to be spun in a centrifuge. The spinning collects the suspended cancer cells into a pellet on the bottom of the cup. The liquid is discarded. By this means, the cells from large volumes of the culture medium are finally concentrated into one cup. The cells are then resuspended in cold sodium chloride solution to dissolve the DNA. The low temperature retards enzyme action. This cell suspension is placed in a blender. The violent action of the blender fragments the cells to facilitate dissolving DNA. After storage overnight in a refrigerator, the DNA dissolves and then the solution will be spun very rapidly in a centrifuge. This spinning action separates the residual cell proteins which contain the enzymes. A high-speed centrifuge is required because the large size of the DNA has made the solution viscous. After the centrifuging, the liquid fraction contains the soluble DNA. The pellet contains the undissolved residue. According to our theory, if the 5-fluorouracil is incorporated into the DNA molecule, radioactivity should be detected in the liquid, otherwise it should be found in the pellet. The next step is to concentrate the DNA. The liquid is drawn off and injected into alcohol, which precipitates the DNA.
These threads of DNA material can be readily collected on a glass stirring rod. A sample of the DNA fraction is removed for measurement of its radioactive content. The protein pellet is retrieved from the centrifuge tube. The meter shows that there is no radioactivity in the chromosomal material. However, the protein fraction does show radioactivity. The experiment proves that the radioactive 5-fluorouracil is not incorporated into the DNA. Though the chemistry is oversimplified as portrayed here, it does show that the structural similarity of 5-fluorouracil to uracil is of crucial importance in its ultimate effect, the enzymatic synthesis of genetic material. 5-fluorouracil is currently one of the most effective chemotherapeutic agents for treating certain types of skin cancer and colon cancer. About 40 anti-cancer agents are in clinical use today. For example, chemotherapy with methotrexate can lead to complete remission for 97% of children treated for acute lymphocytic leukemia. But we need even more effective and less toxic chemicals, especially for lung cancers and brain tumors. In the past, most medicines have been discovered by trial and error, even by accident. Aspirin, the most widely used medicine in the world, was used for almost 100 years with no idea as to how it reacted in the body. Modern techniques are allowing us to learn about living systems at the molecular level and what changes cause loss of health. Now some mechanisms are understood. We are beginning to be able to design molecules the living system needs for recovery.